join me in welcoming Peter Coffey to the stage and enjoy his talk. Thanks, Varney. Absolutely. Good afternoon. I'm glad you all saw that Apple ad this morning with the kid who looked like he wasn't paying any attention, but in fact he was you know, creating content on the fly based on what he saw. Because there I was sitting in front with my laptop open all morning, and you might have been thinking, you know, dude, if you need to check the email, there's a, there's a room in back. But the fact is, so many of the p speakers who preceded me today triggered things that I said, oh yeah, um, I've talked about that, I don't have a slide for that. So maybe a third of the slides you're going to see in the next most of an hour, uh, did not exist uh, before this morning. Those of you who were not intimidated by fractions as children will be saying with a sinking feeling, if a third of the material is new, that means your deck is now one and a half times as long. The good news is that um, I was inspired by the, uh, by the uh, example of um, uh, Antoine Saint-Exupéry, who said uh, it's, it's perfect when there's nothing left to take away. And so I was taking things away as well, and I'm sorry about that. But it was a matter of, of you know, focus and relevance, and maybe I'll still have something to share next year if they invite me to do this again. Um, we're going to be talking about three aspects of engagement. There's a reason why plays have three acts. Uh, as, as Chekhov said, if the gun is shown in the first act, it will have to be used in the third, right? The mandate is change is uncomfortable, many people fear it, and I need to create an aura that says the risks of not change are greater than the risks of change, hence mandate. Practice, how do we execute on that idea of change? Culture, who's going to do it? Who's going to do it? Uh, one of our speakers yesterday apologized for quoting The Art of War. I'm sorry, I'm going to do it again. Because uh, uh, in the commentaries uh, uh, to Sun Tzu, one, someone said, everyone sees my success they do not see the form by which I assure that success. People can watch your behavior and try to imitate it, but the culture you've built that consistently generates those behaviors is not visible to others unless you brag about it as much as we do at Salesforce. And despite having bragged about our culture for 20 years, it does seem, in fact, to be hard to imitate, so we keep doing it. We think it's a differentiator. So, already talked about Anquan. We're going to try not to achieve perfection, but at least try to you know, take as much away as lets me talk about mandate, practice, and culture. It's widely stated that John Maynard Keynes said, when the facts change, I change my mind. It's a great quote. It appears that Paul Samuelson was actually the first to say it, and the second time he said it, he attributed it to Keynes. We can't actually find any evidence that Keynes himself ever said it, but it's too good not to share. And the history of this quote, which has also been attributed to Winston Churchill and various other people, is on quote investigator, and it's kind of fun to read, kind of you know, how ideas bubble up in our lives. But when the facts change, I change my mind. If I want you to change your behavior, I need to change your mind, and that means I need to show you a compelling fact. Because you never go up to someone and say, you've been doing it wrong. At that point, the only way they cannot lose the conversation is by proving that they are right. You need to say, you've been doing a brilliant job so far. Now let me show you some new facts that change the definition of doing a brilliant job. So let me show you some facts. You've seen similar graphs like this, and I'm sorry, but even though I try to use different sources, the graph is not exactly the same year on year. They all have this same hockey stick shape. The amount of connectivity in the world, the amount of bits flowing around that represent intention, desire, behavior. The hockey stick is real. The growth rates are ridiculous. A 45-fold growth between 2005 and 2014, another nine-fold growth projected between 2014 and 2021. This is not just a greater quantity. This is a different nature of the kind of data that we will collect about people. Peter Sondergaard at Gartner said, the old research is asking people, what do you want? Well, Steve Jobs was famously contemptuous of focus groups, saying they won't know what they want till I show it to them. And the new research is measuring what people seem to be trying to do and then bringing them what they wanted that they didn't even know existed so that they wouldn't ask for it and might not have been able to describe, even if they had a rough idea about it. So bandwidth is the crucial changing fact. And it is a global phenomenon. It is not a rich world phenomenon. The green circles are intra-region and the arcs are cross-region. And you can see the Europeans are talking about an awful lot right now. Then again, they've got a lot to talk about. It is very much an Asian phenomenon. I've been known to say that if you don't have an a a India strategy or a China strategy, you have a going out of business strategy. 
the next two billion people who join the middle class globally will be 50% made up of Asians. And you know, the people who come into the middle class become targets of a kind of commerce that they were not engaged with before. They are, they are now exposed to the kind of content that they were not in a position to receive before. They start making purchases where before they would only you know, be doing this from scratch in the kitchen, now they're going out to dinner. Someone said, if you want to take care of the Norwegian grain crop for an entire year, have every family in China go out for a six pack of beer on Friday night. That's the scale that we're talking about when we talk about these new emerging economies becoming very much an audience for the work that we do in this room. And yet, with all this connectivity potential, 37% of customers feel less connected to companies than they did two years ago, which is a remarkable thing. Uh, the green and yellow arcs represent another really important subtext. People are constantly saying that B2B and B2C buyers are fundamentally different in their behavior, and our most recent connected customer study makes it quite clear. The similarities are much stronger than the differences. The B2B buyer is a buyer. They have expectations of experience that are being formed by their experience as individuals, and you treat them as the old-fashioned B2B buyer, only interested in terms and conditions and schedules and, and price, you treat them that way at your peril. Because, again, the green and the yellow arcs, very similar in, in scope. 59% of customers say tailored engagement based on past interactions. Very important to winning their business. If you've done business with them before, don't treat them like a new customer. You need to do something that builds on the momentum, builds on the knowledge that they expect you to have been acquiring over the course of your past interactions. And 70% of customers say service agents who are aware of sales interactions are important. There's the novel idea, because traditionally, marketing through leads over the wall to sales, sales got their money through the customers over the wall to service, told service, try to spend as little money as you can keeping these people from leaving us so that I can sell them better the next time. That's a very old-fashioned kind of interaction. Your service interactions build brand advocacy more successfully than a merely satisfactory experience ever will. Your service interactions are an opportunity to identify boundaries that your customers are bumping up against, upsell and cross-sell opportunities, the chance to do referrals of business to partners. Service is the new fill-in-the-blank, the new sales, the new marketing, the new everything. I was just in, in Dallas for one of our events on uh, the new service perspective that needs to be adopted by so many companies. A little while ago, there was a fad to talk about social selling, and unfortunately, now that we've talked about it for a while, we think that that's an old and uh, maybe outdated idea. But I want to talk a little bit about this phrase, social, that enjoyed a brief, happy life as a, as a meme in this marketing community, because people hear the word social, and it's kind of a deprecatory term. It's, yeah, it's just a social occasion. Uh, it's just a social acquaintance. It means not business, not serious. The opposite of social is antisocial. There is no context in which being antisocial is good. We have coworkers who are antisocial. You knock on their door and they say, What? If they deign to open the door, they have no idea who you are. You might have been talking to them you know, every week or so for years, and they still act like it's a brand new conversation. No memory of the context of past conversations. And do they ever proactively come to you? with something they think you would like to know based on the past interactions you've had? No, they don't do that either. So, they forget their past interactions with you, they are insensitive to your present context, and they are uninterested in future support for your new needs. Gee, do any of you feel an uncomfortable sensation at the moment that some of these adjectives could be applied to the way we market, to the way we sell? And we don't like it in a coworker, and it is toxic today in a sales or service situation. Now things get data intensive, and trust me, all the charts will be available, and many of the graphics are in a report that I will be citing. So you'll, you'll be able to get all the data later on. Just kind of let's, let's absorb the big picture here. We should be able to get the raw material that we need to engage with people. Uh, we carry around these little pieces of magic black glass that we call smartphones. Phones? You're making a lot of phone calls on those things these days. That blue box there highlights the little yellow fringe of the residual activity that's called phone calls 
on our smartphones. As opposed to that red, another hockey stick curve, the growth in data traffic. Um, calling them smartphones is kind of like the uh, legacy thinking that lets us call email copies CCs. Have you tried to explain carbon paper to a millennial lately? <laughs> and yet we're still calling our emails carbon copies? Really? Really? Wow. Why aren't they just plain Cs? Because. But Apple says that we check in around 80 times a day on those little pieces of magic black glass. And every time we do it, we create what the set theorists call a tuple and what the rest of us can call a digital breadcrumb, a multidimensional record of who did what from where, after seeing what, after talking to whom, who did they tell later, where did they go, what did they do next. I could probably add another 15 dimensions to that. In fact, I could add the dimension of what was the ambient smell in the room at the time because it has been observed that today we can engineer smell in the retail environment. The, the uh, leather goods store can smell like really good leather. The, uh, the bake shop can smell like fresh baked bread. Smell triggers are amazingly powerful. And someone said the engineering of smell in the retail environment today is about where the engineering of music was maybe 15, 20 years ago. It's going to become a new expectation that you'll know the right aura, the right ambiance to create in any situation. Fortunately, with all this data coming at us, we have the power to crunch that data. The old business data is the record of the byproduct of business activity, preserved, reported, summarized, forgotten. The new stuff needs crunching. Uh, this is a logarithmic scale, I will point out. Every one of those bars is a power of 10, and it's still going up. The quantity of compute power available is keeping pace with the quantity of data available to you. These things together are compelling, changed facts. Failing to operate in this world as opposed to a better, faster, cheaper version of the 1955 world. You all saw that documentary Mad Men, I believe, about the, the, the way these things were done, so yes. When you have all this connectivity and all this computation, ideas that were talked about in 1955, when the first, let's do AI as a summer project memo was written. Seriously, the phrase says, we believe a 10-man, two-month study can make meaningful progress on, and then they promptly listed several multi-decade problems. I'm sorry, they did say 10-man study. It was a different time. But we used to think that the way you did AI was by having non-existent specialists called knowledge engineers interview human experts, ask how do you do that, write down the results as rules, throw those into a thing called an inference engine, create an expert system. Expert systems enjoyed a short, happy life in the 1980s. I was present for their autopsy. When we discovered that if you build them well enough, if you can actually find human experts who can explain how they do what they do, which are very, very rare people indeed, you wind up with thousands of rules, half of which change every year, not a sustainable proposition. But among the ideas also discussed in 1955 was building systems that could learn. And when you've got a connected planet full of people leaving digital breadcrumbs behind 80 times a day, there's a lot of stuff from which you can learn. So the old method was teaching IBM's Deep Blue to play chess by having human chess masters instruct it, where it allowed it to play a pretty decent game. It would not do anything terribly surprising because it had been taught by people. It knew everything that people knew about chess, and that's all it knew. As opposed to when Google built something to play Go, a computationally much more difficult game to characterize. They didn't teach it the game, they taught it the rules and let it play against copies of itself at phenomenal speed. You've seen the last scene in war games when the thing learns to you know, play by playing tic-tac-toe against itself that the only winning move is not to play. Well, that was actually what they pretty much did with this. The result being that one of the world's top five Go players played against this thing in a tournament format. A move was made that made this guy get up and leave the room to think for 10 minutes. He'd never seen that before. No one had seen that move before. If you're waiting for the Skynet moment when these things are capable of surprising us, it's here, and they don't have the launch codes yet. But now, your customers actually want to tell you what you need to enable a superior experience. There's a lot of angst right now about, oh, people don't want to be snooped on. This is correct. If I take data without your consent and use it without your knowledge to do things that benefit only me, you will march upon my corporate headquarters with torches and pitchforks. If I offer you for only $5 a year the opportunity to become a platinum customer 
and enjoy the following additional services in return for which I need you to check this box that gives me permission to collect the following data. They will pay you to collect the data they would have tried to kill you for taking without their permission. It is the Tom Sawyer painting the fence phenomenon. If I have to pay for it, I'll do it. Must be good. Must be valuable. So let's talk about, from our State of the Connected Customer Report, the things specifically that people will share relevant information about themselves if they can get personalized offers or discounts, personalized online shopping experiences, personalized in-store experiences, personalized product recommendations. Those of you not picking up the word personalized yet, I could say it 10 times more, but I think you've gotten the point. It is not how great was the experience if you ignore the question of how much did it feel like was tailored to me. The ability to personalize at scale, with precision, with grace, in a way that doesn't rub people's noses in the technology, but makes them feel like, wow, they really know me. That is what seven-eighths of our surveyed customers say they want if they're going to do business with you. And their expectations of experience. I'm sorry, if you, I, I, I think I said last year, if you want to live in the future, work in the luxury markets because yesterday's luxury is today's middle class aspiration is tomorrow's everybody's got one. If you're, if you're doubting this, look at the Motorola Dynatac cell phone with its 30 minute battery that in today's prices, post inflation adjustment was a $9,400 device that makes an iPhone 10 actually look like a bargain. And it was the badge of the affluent and or the pretentious. But now, everybody's carrying one of these things, and in particular, most companies are not meeting my expectations for a great experience, for which I would cheerfully pay them more if they would just darn well do it right. And 77% of customers say the experience is as important as the product. You know, the worst product you can buy in many spaces today is pretty darn good. A Toyota Corolla 30 years ago would probably crush a sports sedan costing three times as much. I mean, the, the standard of what we expect in products today has become really quite remarkable. And so the opportunity to differentiate and create a branded prestigious luxury feel is much more at the level of the experience. I had this conversation with a hotel chain and I said, you know, you could spend twice as much on the granite countertops in the bathroom. I'm only in the bathroom long enough to brush the teeth and fall asleep. It's really not doing much for me. But if you can differentiate the experience, the pre-arrival experience, oh, we notice you're going to be arriving on date X, your check-in time is 9 o'clock. If it's feasible for you to arrive at 6, this is Taste of Chicago week, and we'd love to have a discount coupon waiting for you. Wow, the experience begins even before I'm in the room. It's tailored to my personal behavior. It, maybe they know where I'm coming from. Maybe because I am a platinum customer of this hotel chain, I routinely provide them with information on my flights so that they know when I'm getting in and can even say, hey, if it's possible for you to get the same airline's flight two hours earlier, we can have a table waiting for you at Event X. They can do this. It is possible to deliver this kind of thing. And 82% of business buyers also say, I want an Amazon class experience when I'm buying for my business. I'm going to let you think about that for a little bit. Whatever you've been told about the B2B buyer is different. I'm sorry, that's getting less true every day. So the experience. Here's an interesting measure of the convergence of experience. Facebook used to trade at 40 times earnings, Google at 2, and now they've converged. They're both trading around 28 times. Why? Google and Facebook have turned into the same thing. They just started from different places. And my question when I saw that number is, what about Walmart and Amazon? And then the Winter Olympics happened. Did anyone see the saturation bombing of Walmart ads on the TV coverage for the Winter Olympics? Did you see a single picture of something happening in a Walmart store? I don't believe you did. I don't think a single one of those Walmart ads showed an in-store experience. It was, I believe, 100.0% depictions of people in their homes, going about their lives, having, having Walmart say, oh, looks like you're probably going to be needing diapers in a week, having these proactive personalized offers result in the things showing up on their doorstep. 100% now marketing the experience because Walmart, always the low price always, well, that was a very important statement a while ago. It's increasingly difficult to achieve the lowest price 
in, in today's world, but to deliver a superior experience, that's something you can do. And you can brand and promote that experience. But be very, very careful. Be very, very careful. When you're hunting the rabbits, that you don't think you can just trowel on the AI lipstick and make every pig beautiful to every customer because it's not the case. This is our Connected Investor Report where we looked at specific things you might do. There's that P word again, personalized emails and texts related to financial goals. I should be getting different messaging and different items from you if you're catering to me from my point of view as a retiree to be as opposed to being a young parent. And you know, financial emails, predictions of portfolio performance, very quantitative, automated investments, very hands-off, customer service chatbots. Everyone thinks that they hate the idea of chatbots until they actually spend time with them and discover the chatbot always answers by the second ring, never needs to be told anything that it's already been told before, never gets angry at you when you ask a stupid question, and people say, this is more personal than a person. But I want you to notice something. Of all those various differentiations across the millennials, the Gen Xers, and the baby boomers, only one has at least one third saying that they would be appealed to by, and that's personalized emails, texts, etc. Any one of the others? Well, let's see. You know, financial emails and texts, eh, the baby boomers aren't real interested in that. Portfolio predictions, nah, not so much. Automated investments, but, oh boy, those baby boomers are tough. Customer service chatbots, they're convinced they don't want those. Um, but only the millennials say they don't want any of this. We're going to talk about the millennials in a moment because they will violate your expectations a few slides from now. Personalization is the one thing that at least one out of three across every demographic said, yep, I want more of that. I hope I'm making this point very, very clear. So let's keep going. Oh, yeah, millennials. U.S. retail banks spent $20 billion dollars on digital transformation initiatives in 2017. Dang, this is going to suck. When they read the J.D. Power report on retail banking this year that find that the most digital-only customers are the least satisfied with their banking experience. Guess what, guys? Congratulations. You cut your cost by reducing the number of teller interactions. In the process, you commodified your experience to the point that your customer sense of differentiation across any bank is less, they're more susceptible to the, we'll give you $50 to try us for three months offer. You've managed to turn them into pure generic consumers of a banking service that has no differentiation, no face they recognize, no personality whatsoever. And the millennials are the ones who are most unsatisfied by having a digital only experience. Who knew? Who knew? The old folks who really didn't want to drive down to the branch, they're actually pretty happy with being able to get everything done. The millennials actually find more of their satisfaction being driven by the sense of a personal relationship. So, here is the challenge. They expect you to be bringing them something new all the time. Roughly 9 sixteenths of them want new products and services more frequently than ever before. Roughly two-thirds, it takes more for a company to impress me with new products than ever before. 56%, uh, I actively seek to buy from the most innovative. I, I think these are different measures of all the same thing. What have you done for me lately? What have you brought me that no one else is going to bring me? What did you bring me, Daddy? This is what innovation now has to be, not bold, strategic, wow, they've never seen this before, but more like, hey, what have we done that's new? recently to keep them engaged with us and say, wow, I'm always getting the, the best stuff from them. Um, they think that AI is going to matter. They're nine times as likely to say it's revolutionary as to say it's insignificant. They're interested in what you can do with augmented reality. Four times as likely to say revolutionary as insignificant. Really interested in personal assistance, voice-activated personal assistance. The Amazon Echo and Google Home type device was the hottest tech retail product in the winter holiday season last year. So these things do matter. But the problem is we would all like to believe that we are innovators. We want to believe that people are always looking for ways to make things better. And I'm sorry, no, we're not. 
We want to make things incrementally better. We want to make them a little bit better in ways that we understand. Many of you have heard the expression paving the cow paths to describe, okay, this is how we do this. Now we'll add some new technology to it and it'll be better. Yeah, maybe, you think? I don't know. Because when Apple introduced the iPod, Sony had three different divisions competing against each other with MP3 player designs. They thought the MP3 player was the product. And Apple said, no, not so much. The product is music in your pocket at a reasonable price, easy to find, of uniformly high quality without that sinking feeling that you're illegally you know, ripping off tracks that you're not allowed to have. They brought out a device that the market initially saw as overpriced, feature poor, and yet three years later, the Oxford English Dictionary notes the emergence of a whole new word called podcast. We didn't call them that before the iPod. They managed to make the definition of something people had already been doing be named by their product by designing an experience and an engagement offer around the idea instead of thinking the product was the goal. The music was the goal. iPod was the means. It rewrote the vocabulary of how to consume content online, which today pretty much means how to consume content. People are very good at incremental improvement. In the caves outside Beijing, the fossil record is quite clear. 10,000 generations of recognizably humanoid creatures innovated their hand axes from 5.5 to 4.5 centimeters over a period of 200,000 years. So for those of you who remember the, uh, the infatuation with you know, Japanese Kaizen techniques of relentless incremental improvement, yeah, that idea has been around for a while. It does not get you from the hand axe to the screwdriver. Doesn't get you there. Doesn't, doesn't, certainly doesn't get you the water jet for cutting stuff, let alone the laser. People are naturally inclined toward incremental improvement. Designing an innovative organization is an intentional act. You have to do specific things. That's why I included the word culture in the title of the talk today. Creating a culture that can do what the previous data shows your customer demands, continuous innovation to deliver what the earlier data shows your customer demands, a remarkable, differentiating, personalized, engaged experience. Oh yeah, you'll say, oh, we're not primitive man apes. Well, Sony weren't primitive man apes, but they spent at least two cycles too many further developing the Trinitron picture tube when the flat panel was clearly what was going on. You have to be prepared to disrupt yourself. The people running the company are proud of the great idea they had that made the company what it is today and persuading them that they were brilliant then, and if they want to keep being brilliant, they have to let the old idea go. It's not an easy thing to do. Show them examples. We'll talk about that. Because innovation starts out being about technology in the 1950s. Oh yeah, it's transistorized. By definition, innovative. Yeah, that was the first transistor. The, uh, the large object in the middle there, which today would be small enough that Visible light wavelengths are too big to see it by. You have to use ultraviolet now. And then very quickly, within 10 years, well, of course it's transistorized, but is it gold? Is it called an air chief? Is it, is, does it have a number eight on this front? I have no idea what that number was supposed to represent. It became a packaging of the experience very quickly. And then you started talking to other people because there's a transistor radio, except that it's got Bluetooth and it's got... Uh, internet connection and it is substantially empowered by your ability to participate in a collaborative marketplace instead of jealously guarding your secrets. The degree to which you become an open platform is now a really important piece of your ability to offer a branded experience that gains leverage from all this work that other people are doing. Because by bringing it together you become the brand that they think of as innovative. Everyone else is just the plumbing in your basement. This is a good place to be and you have to work really hard. I have observed on occasionally that if you're taking a Porsche around the Nürburgring, the tires are pretty darn important to the performance. No teenage boy has a poster on his wall of a stack of the tires he hopes to own someday. He wants the Porsche. He takes the tires for granted. So what are you going to do? What are you going to do to make the people who provide the things that let your product be awesome be the plumbing, be the tires, be the background, while you get to be the aspirational brand of experience. How are you going to do that? 
The other thing that has happened in very recent time, remember uh, 11 years ago when the iPhone was a brand new thing, it did not have an app store. At the time, in fact, Salesforce owned the trademark App Store, which Mark Benioff gave as a gift to Steve Jobs, possibly, according to lore, to thank him for having given him his first great job, possibly because Apple's got way more lawyers than we did at the time. But they didn't have an App Store. And at the time, a software patch was a bad thing, a confession that you had screwed up that you were going to be asking your customers to incur nuisance and risk to install new software before they thought it was going to be arriving at a comfortable upgrade interval of, you know, two or three years. And now you pull out your phone in the morning, there's a little red circle with a little white number and it says eight. Oh, I've got eight apps that need updating. Do you sandbox them and regression test all of your configuration options to be sure they haven't broken? The heck you do. You tap update all and go back to drinking your coffee. That is how we, much of a 180 degree spin we have made from constant improvement of products being expensive, risky, and infrequent to continuous improvement being something that happens pretty much literally every day at an expected cost of zero, at an expected nuisance of zero, and in fact an app that is not frequently updated starts to acquire a certain mossy aroma around it of why, why aren't they making this thing any better? Talk about an expectation change. So the teams you're going to build, remember I promised we'd talk about culture. They need to come at the situation from different perspectives. Jack Hughes at Topcoder says, the last thing I need is eight experts on the same thing, mutually reinforcing their past conventional wisdom. They've been reading each other's papers for years. No, I need an algorithm specialist, a coder, a radiation oncologist, maybe a game designer. I need to harness mental energies from different perspectives that changes the game. Game changing is a phrase that's used too much, but the example I will often offer is that you got a bunch of people playing rugby and they're working really hard down in that scrum. The person who invents the forward pass that goes over their heads has, in fact, changed the game in a fundamental way. Introducing air power to warfare. The first air power was just balloons that could observe. And next thing you knew, you had flying weapons platforms. It changes the game. And asking what's someone possibly going to do to us that changes the game is uh, an interesting exercise to have. Unfortunately, we are not good at training diverse people or diverse teams. If we assume that we're not going to get into Eastern religion beliefs in reincarnation, we can assume we all start out knowing pretty much nothing. And kindergarten, you know, there's the nap taking thing. First grade, now maybe there's pencil sharpening. Second grade, you know, maybe some JavaScript. By third or fourth grade, people are starting to identify you as a um, mathy sciencey type or an artsy, you know, humanities type. So you go off to college and you work for a few years, you get your bachelor's degree, bump up against the boundaries of what's in a textbook, and now you've got a four-year degree and they send you out into the workforce. Unless you hang around, start pushing against that boundary for a while. A few years later, you break through the boundary and congratulations, you have added to the store of human knowledge. You are a member of the academy and they give you a hood and call you a PhD. Your world now looks like this. People who are PhDs and people who are trying to become you. And it's so easy to lose track of the fact that to the rest of the world, you look like that little bump on the circle. And I cannot get a broad set of perspectives if I hire 10 of you. I'm still just looking at, the, at one pixel on the rim of a circle. You have to say, I'm going to build teams with different perspectives, or maybe you can be lucky and hire people who bring multiple perspectives. John Kennedy, uh, President Kennedy, once at a dinner at the White House for some Nobel Prize laureates said, this is the most amazing diversity of knowledge ever assembled in the White House, except perhaps when Thomas Jefferson dined alone. And being, being Jeffersonian, you know, be, having people say, wow, who knew? that he could bring in some example from the jazz band he plays in on the weekend, the rock climbing he did on Sunday, and his years of experience in marketing to put together this idea for an immersion experience for the customer. That's a nice place to be. And alternatively, you can be the person who said, hey, let's get the rock climber and the jazz musician into the room. I'll bet they could provide something too. So you can curate that diversity.
and you can become valuable in proportion to your ability to be the person who pulls that interesting team together. Transdisciplinarity, which is what I'm talking about, does not look like this, and oh, by the way, it, neither does it look like that. There is a hugely underrepresented talent pool, one of many, um, specifically in the tech industry, women. They're not the only one. The group uh, Code 2040, which we support at Salesforce as one of our philanthropic endeavors, is called Code 2040 because that is the year in which it is projected that white people stop being more than 50% of the United States, which means that if the non-whites continue to be underrepresented by a factor of two, typically, in technology occupations, we are losing access to a really important talent pool. So focusing on the women is, is one of the important things, but the general question of how do we lower the barriers to entry for the underrepresented groups is a really important question because that's how you get diversity of perspective. By the way, uh, some research out of, um, I forget who did this one, but it was reported in the New York Times. If you invest in startups with female founders, you get 63% greater return than if you invest in male-only organizations. Now, this could be interpreted in various ways. Among the ways to interpret it is, the, if a female founder manages to get to the point where she is even in front of a team of investors, she's got to be double the awesomeness of the average male, so there you go. But the point is, this is not something you do to feel good about yourself. This is something you do because it's pure rational self-interest to get more points of view into the room. Interestingly, one of the organizations that's doing the most for this is the Girl Scouts, um, also, I believe, the single largest nonprofit user of Salesforce stuff. Uh, everyone thinks the Girl Scouts' problem is that young women have too many other things to do these days. Actually, it turns out that when we looked at the real data, their biggest bottleneck was that so many women who in past times would have been available after school to lead a Girl Scout troop were now, you know, like lawyers, doctors, marketers, and so on. And their backlog was finding and qualifying women to run the troops, not finding girls to populate them. So there's a case where conventional wisdom was almost 180 degrees wrong, looking at the data matters. And the Girl Scouts have introduced twice as many STEM-related merit badges in the last three years as they had prior to that time. So I urge you to look not at merely the college graduate pool, but at this question of why do girls who are more into math and science than boys from K through 6 start to fall off that STEM pathway between sixth grade and high school graduation, let alone between freshman and sophomore years of college, which is a deadly time for talent leakage, and how can we show them more examples of you know, models that they can follow and let them wind up being the innovative, collaborative, alternative perspective members of our teams that we really need to find. Because teams matter. Jeff Bezos uses the expression two pizza team. If the team is too big to be fed by two pizzas, it's too big to feel a sense of personal accountability to each other and you wind up losing track of what's going on. Research from military combat, from performing arts, from professional sports, all supports the idea. People achieve at the most extraordinary levels, not because they're seeking rewards, not because they're fearing harm to themselves, but because they don't want to let down a team that is small enough that they can feel a sense of personal accountability to that team. So there's ways to do this. We found out, by the way, during the great financial crisis, that giving people monetary bonuses actually introduces uh, risk aversion behaviors that can be really quite toxic as opposed to, hey, let's all go take that hill together. Praise and commendation from the immediate manager, a strikingly superior way of getting people to say, wow, I want to be like that. Employee of the month plaques. People will take pictures of that and send them to their parents. They might bring their parents into the office to show them that employee of the month plaque. You can't really frame a picture of your bonus check and hang it on the wall. In the United States culture, that's kind of you know, frowned upon. There are cultures where you can brag about the amount of your bonus. I don't think I want to work in any of those. But being, having, having the team say, hey, this is how we do this here. One of my favorite stories at Foxborough uh, Instruments uh, in, in Massachusetts, an engineer came into the CEO's office late one night having solved a problem that was keeping a critical product from coming to market. The CEO wanted to give this engineer a positive act of affirmation saying, you just did something really great for us. 
looked around the office for something that wasn't nailed down. Only thing in sight was a banana on his desk. Picks it up and hands it to him and says, great job, here. The Golden Banana Award, a lapel pin worn by people who've been honored for distinguished technical contribution at Foxborough is one of the company's most treasured recognitions. Because it was in the moment and it said, you done good and I want everyone to know. And creating that culture can be tremendously powerful. We do this with a lot of badging at Salesforce. We badge everything. We encourage people to invent badges on the spur of the moment. I do not know what the Charlie's Angels badge was invented to, uh, to recognize, but I'm sure it was considered a good idea at the time. And interestingly, you don't just badge for recognition of individual accomplishment. We took one of those boring subjects in the world, which is information security awareness and adherence to practices. We started out with the Padawan Jedi Apprentice level badge, which says, I've started work on the certification. I've tested. I'm doing it. Ooh, Jedi Master. I'm teaching it. Jedi Grand Master. I've made proposals that have improved it. We didn't take the badge of, yes, I can do this. We turned it into a spectrum of badges that says, thank you, come along, or thank you for making us all better. And recognizing achievement across that entire spectrum that isn't just centered on this is what I learned to do, but this is what I'm beginning to try to learn. Will anyone help? And this is what I would love to share. Let's all do it better. That's a kind of recognition that's qualitatively different from just having the certification, the, the, the checkbox, the paperweight, whatever. However, a lot of companies are saying the recruits, the students are getting, they're not equipped. They've got you know, soft skills, but they need real hard skills training. They've got their hard skills. They don't have the soft skills to be effective. They aren't good collaborators. They, they don't function well in an environment where there's give and take and experimentation. And there's not enough work on this. Only about half of companies are, are working on having a formal plan, let alone a plan that's being implemented. And boy, I don't know who these people are up in the teal level that don't see this as an area of concern. Paul Dougherty at Accenture has been quoted as saying that by their research numbers, roughly 50% of companies say that the people they have don't have the skills to take the company where it wants to go. 3% of them are increasing training investments to deal with that issue. I don't think that's going to cut it. I think we, we can't just wait. We have to be out there in the schools ourselves, ass assisting in maybe creating collaborative academic and curricula uh, programs that get people on the ramp toward being ready to work with us the day they arrive instead of needing a year of training before they're just a drain on payroll. Interestingly, it turns out that the old phrase, the beatings will continue until morale improves, should be retired very quickly. Happy employees stick around longer and turn into your Jedi Grand Masters. Happy employees innovate more. They, they say, you know, I'm going to be here for a while. Let's, let's, let, let me you know, put, take a few risks here. Let me put out some ideas. You want to do, frankly, what I do every chance I get, which is to say Salesforce is about creating customer connection and team effectiveness. I always add that. We always talk about customer connection. But I think team effectiveness, and Peter Drucker also has said very similar things. If you take care of your people, they'll take care of your customers, and that will take care of your profits. Trying to move the profitability needle by moving that directly is about as successful as moving the needle on your speedometer and expecting the car to go faster. No. Profits are an indicator of customer engagement, which is an output of engaged employees that the customer says, wow, these people are really in it for me. It can be done. It is cultural engineering, but it can be done. In particular, the phrase, let's all fail faster, uh, I don't think that's the best way to present the idea because no one actually wants to be a failure. But someone at uh, Dreamforce this year said, we're not embracing failure. We're creating a culture that learns from experiment. And Salesforce knows what it is to do this because in 2006, that's a seven-year-old company, we were starting to show some distressing symptoms of turning from cute little startup puppy into big, wet, smelly software dog. We had release frequency falling, initial quality issues. It, it was, hey, what are we going to do? We've seen this pattern before, and we don't want to be the next player of that pattern. At the very top level, 
a cultural engineering decision was made to move to what Jeff Bezos calls two pizza teams, what many people call scrums or agile processes, consciously designing products in a way that modularized features so that a team that owned that feature could say, no, this one's not ready yet. Ship this one in four months on the next release. No one yells at them because you designed things properly so that their decision didn't hurt other people. They're willing to make that delay because they don't have to wait three years for that next release. They'll get to ship their work and see the results of their effort in only four months. So this combination of consciously designing your processes so that the team that owns a, a piece of good stuff can own the choice of when it's ready for the customers to see it and be confident that if they hold it back one tick of the clock, the next one will be soon enough to feel good. Getting those two things right, I believe, is necessary. Take away either one, you won't get the behavior that I think we all want, which is a culture that continuously generates these innovations that I remind you, our research says our customers demand, that I remind you are part of what our customers say is the experience that they want you to give them. And so there we are, quantify the results. Eight straight years, the only years that list has been published of membership in the top three of Forbes World's Most Innovative Companies, feature delivery, and so on. Break the fourth wall for a moment. You were here for the beginning of the day. Anyone notice that I just told a story that began with exposition? Here was a bad situation. Rising action. We decided to try something. Climax. We decided we were going to adopt Scrum and Agile processes. It was hard. People protested, said, you can't build an enterprise product that way. And the CEO and the co-founder looked into the wind and said, we're going to do it. Resolution, it got done. Freytag's pyramid of story construction. Stories with structure engage people on a level that their brains cannot resist. The reason human beings are alive without the fangs, the claws, and the speed of, animal, of, of predator animals is that we learned at an early age to tell each other stories and pay attention. So we could each begin our learning from the level of the people who'd come before. Our brains are wired for this. And if I say to you, the sun did not shine, it was too wet to play, so we sat in the house all that cold, cold, wet day. You have to know, well, what happened next? And it only took him 236 different words to write that story. Stories begin with a hook that makes you say, tell me more, want to know more. That's not content that bores people. That's content that makes people say, well, wow, I can't wait for the next episode. What are you going to tell me next week? You can do this. You can design processes to do this. And the problem is we get bored too quickly. We ourselves get bored with our own content. We give up on it. Uh, Henry Ford once asked one of his people, how much longer are we going to run that campaign? And the copywriter said, customers haven't seen it yet. They'd been agonizing over it and planning it for so long, they'd come to the conclusion it was out of date and they hadn't even deployed the thing. How many of you have sat around iterations of a campaign and by the time you show it to the customer, you're bored with it? You think they can't tell? And you, you, you said yourself this morning, every time you tell the story, you got to bring. You got to bring that way you felt that when that story was brand new to you because they can tell if you're just parroting, your, you're parroting the script. They can tell. And here's the list that David Ogilvy asked about a big idea. Did I gasp when I saw it and wish I'd thought of it myself? Is anyone else doing it already? No, that's good. Does it fit our strategy? Very important. And could it be used for 30 years? 30 years? 30 years without a change? Well, let's see. In 1955, Dove started saying that Dove doesn't dry your skin the way soap can. I downloaded this image off of Amazon this morning. The new Dove Dry Oil Beauty Bar uh, doesn't dry your skin like ordinary soap. David Ogilvy was calling that campaign old in 1983, and here we are 35 years later, and it's on Amazon still. It was the right promise and it's delivered in a new context all the time, but it's a promise that everybody identifies with that brand. Resist the temptation to become bored with something that's working. Present it in a new way, personalize it, sure. But don't think you've got to find a whole new story every few years because that can be a very toxic belief. 
And people are constantly saying, oh, they've heard that before, they've heard that before, they've heard that before. Herman Ebbinghaus uh, called it the curve of forgetting. If I see it once, I've forgotten it in 10 days. Half of me have forgotten it in two weeks. And it, and it just keeps on trailing down. But if I give someone a second reminder 10 days later, the slope is reduced. I'm sorry, the first reminder, uh, one day later, the slope is reduced. Second reminder, third reminder. Not only do you continually refresh their awareness of what you're saying, but the likelihood that they'll forget it over time materially declines. Don't be afraid to repeat. You can repeat with variation. That's cool. That's, that's what uh, Bach did. It was called writing a fugue. And if you can be fugal in the, in the way you do your campaign, say, what's the theme here? Okay, how can, we, how can we modify that theme, but stick to the theme, make it recognizable, make them know what they're seeing. Resist the urge to, to campaign against competition because that just elevates awareness of the competitor. No, focus on your theme and do it again and again in ways that make people say, wow, they're always paying attention to me. Keynes may never have said, when the facts change, I change my mind. And the other sentence that he may never have said after that is, what do you do? That is the key question. If after today, if after tomorrow, you're back in the office, you're saying, wow, another great big sky, big ideas. Okay, let's have that meeting to talk about that campaign again. Then this was fun. It was a great social experience. We all felt good. I want to know what you're going to do differently next week. What conversation are you going to have with someone in a piece of your organization that your piece traditionally doesn't talk to at all? What metric are you going to evaluate and say, is it possible this thing is accurately measurable but not actually telling us what we think it does? What change are you going to be bold enough to propose that builds the culture of continuous expected innovation that creates the differentiating experience that your customers demand? Because the facts have changed, and the question is, what are you going to do? Thank you.